Ladies and gentlemen, I'm George Thorman. I'd like to welcome you to another local history program. Today we're going to spend the next hour um, discussing the Honorable Thomas Talbot, the most famous settler that Elgin County ever had. And to uh, help me with this program, I have as my guest today, John Carr, who lives on the original Talbot property uh, called Malahide Farms. John, I think we'll start right off by saying that Talbot was born on the 19th of July, 1771, at Malahide Castle, and we have a picture of that. Yes, that's right, George. Um, here's a picture of Malahide Castle. I took this picture on a recent trip, I think it was about three years ago, and um, it shows the castle as it is today, and it's rather an interesting um, uh, structure. Um, it goes back to the 13th century, and of course the Talbots were established there by William the Conqueror, um, and lived uh, at Malahide, as it was called, the, the little town nearby is called Malahide, and um, that's the, where the name Malahide Castle comes from. Malahide actually is a, is a Gaelic word, meaning high on a cliff overlooking the sea. So um, the name given to Malahide is appropriate because it overlooks the Irish Sea. And the, the, the um, owners of Malahide were always known as the admirals of the Irish Sea. Were they? <laughs> Now, uh, Talbot uh, was born then into what we call the Anglo-Irish aristocracy. And uh, just what does that mean? Well, of course, Ireland has always been um, uh, an important part of British history. Uh, sometimes, quite often, in fact, a, th a thorn in the, in the flesh of the English crown. Um, it was always used as an invasion route, Ireland, from Europe. Um, by various monarchs trying to put other monarchs off the throne, um, and also by, by other um, people like Napoleon wanting to gain a foothold in a, uh, what you might call the, the, the soft underbelly of, of um, the British Isles, which is Ireland, because um, the Irish are, are um, basically uh, of Celtic origin and um, the invaders who came over with uh, William the Conqueror and the Saxons and the Picts and people like that were people who drove the, the, um, the Celtic people um, farther and farther out to the fringes of the islands. And so we find them um, in Ireland and uh, in the north of Scotland at this, at this time. Uh, but the, uh, the, so the Anglo side of it is anyone who has come as a conqueror, as it were, to Ireland. And the Irish side of it is the intermingling between the, uh, the British conquerors and the Irish people. And um, so to be Anglo-Irish, one has to have uh, a little bit of both sides um, showing up in their pedigree. Now, uh, Talbot was not the oldest son in the family. Uh, so um, he had to, he's no chance of him inheriting the property. Uh, so what did they decide for a career for? Well, um, for a, um, an aristocratic family, such as the family that Colonel Talbot came from, uh, there were really only three choices, and those were the three estates, the church, the law, or the uh, military service. Uh, Talbot was the youngest uh, son. No, he was the second youngest son. His elder brother inherited the, the, um, the estates, um, and uh, Talbot was the second son, and he had another brother, William, and of course they, they both went into the army. And um, so uh, Talbot's career began um, as, uh, as an ensign in, I think it's the 24th foot, at the yeah. age of 12. <laughs> which seems a little bit young, but we have lots of uh, army cadets floating around today, I suppose, who are 12. But anyway, he went in as an ensign in, at the age of 12, and then in that fall he was made a lieutenant. And then the regiment was the 66th foot, I think it's called. Yeah. And uh, then the regiment was disbanded, and he went home and went back to school. And now he was paid as an ensign. Yeah. Uh, then uh, I suppose he went back to school for a few years until 1787 when he was uh, made a lieutenant in the 24th Regiment of Foot and an aide-de-camp 
to the governor of Ireland. The Viceroy of Ireland. Yes. Yeah. What was his name? Uh, it was Lord. Uh, it was the Duke of Buckingham at the time. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, Colonel Talbot had a, a, a chum, a local chum, who who grew up on the next estate to to him, and his name was Arthur Wellesley. And they both went to the court of the, the Viceroy in Dublin. And Arthur Wellesley went off to India and made himself a distinguished uh, soldier and eventually became the, the Duke of Wellington. And of course, Talbot, uh, after serving in the army for some time, decided uh, after serving in Canada that he wanted to go to Canada mm -hmm. and, um, and start settling that yeah. country. Well, I, uh, I got here. Now, when he became an uh, aide de camp to uh, Buckingham, he was just 16 years old. Yes. And Wellesley was an aide-de-camp, too, who was 16. Now, in 1790, he's now 19, he comes to Quebec with his regiment, which is, or to join his regiment, and then in 1791 to Montreal, and then in 1791 Simcoe came to Canada as the governor of Upper Canada. Yes. And uh, uh, he hired uh, Talbot as his private secretary. Yes, well, um, it was quite a usual thing to put young, uh, promising young officers as on mm. the staff of uh, someone like the, it was really a military governor. He was yeah. a lieutenant governor. He was the first lieutenant governor of, of Upper Canada. Right. And of course, um, he was in, at Niagara-on-the-Lake. That, was the, that mm. was the seat of the government at that time. And if anyone uh, goes to Niagara-on-the-Lake, you'll see a picture of Airy, uh, not Airy, um, of... No, Simcoe, uh, sitting at the first legislature meeting in Upper Canada, and Talbot's on his left-hand side. Uh, that's in the um, the old um, the, the old fort. At, oh yes, um, at, Niagara, at, on the Niagara on the Lake. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now uh, he was quite a hit with Mrs. Simcoe. Um, well, I think uh, yes, uh, uh, Mrs. Simcoe was one of these uh, brave souls who went out with her husband to to rough it in the mm -hmm. bush. And um, she was a very talented person herself. Yeah. She was a good cook, I, I gather. And uh, probably if you found a good cook, um, you probably found people like Colonel Talbot sitting around wanting to have some pie. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> now, uh, yes, I think yeah. uh, they got along very well. Yeah. And um, uh, of course, Talbot was a, uh, rather like a son to, to um, Mrs. Simcoe. Mm. Now, in 1793, he's still at Newark, and uh, Simcoe decides to take a trip down to Detroit. And uh, from Newark, they make their way overland uh, to what's now Brantford and uh, Burford, and then uh, come to the Thames. And then they take a cruise down the Thames. And uh, that was the first trip Talbot had to this territory. Now, at the, that was the trip where Simcoe decided on the site of London. That's right, yes. He wanted to call it uh, New Georgia on the Thames, or Georgina, yes. Um, it, it, uh, his, he was really thinking about the military implications of it because it was well back from the lake and from the invasion routes. Uh, and it was in a promising agricultural part of the, of the country. And of course, the, the fur trade of, was still going on, but it was moving farther away. And the second wave of settlement, which was uh, the consolidation of the settlement on the land and the production of food. Um, this was all in the wind at the time. So London, or New Georgia on the Thames, named after King George the Third, of, cor uh, the, the of course, uh, New Georgia was an attractive site to, to, um, to Simcoe and, yeah. to the, and to the government. Yeah, well now, uh, a, a lot of historians say that uh, this was the trip in which Talbot first saw Port Talbot, which eventually settled. But that's not true, is it? Well, it, it's hard to say. Um, he, uh, I'm not just sure what, what the route was that they took, but undoubtedly they would have to have uh, perhaps gone down the Thames and then back along the lake. Uh, and going back along the lake, they would have come to uh, Rondo and then around Rondo and along the North Shore. And it's quite possible that on their way yep. back, they camped overnight at, uh, 
at Port Talbot. Yeah. It was on the map at the time because the French explorers had put it there. Yeah, yeah, that would be Galinet's map. Uh, it was made in the 1600s. That, 1683, uh, I think. Yeah, it was the and first that showed uh, Kettle Creek and uh, what's now Talbot Creek. Yeah. They weren't named. Well, it was named. It was uh, La Salle named it after one of his captains, a man by the name of Tonti. And I well, think this is Kettle Creek, though. Isn't it? Oh, I thought no. I th no, it's on the map. It shows as as Riviere Tonti. The what's now Talbot Creek. I, I may be incorrect. Yeah, I'm. That, I'm just uh, wondering about that, and perhaps should have done some research. I thought he came back with Simcoe uh, via the site of London again, and I uh, then the next couple of years he's in negotiations with the Indians in Ohio. Yes. And he might then very well have stopped at what's now Port Talbot and had a look at it. That's, that's quite possible. Interestingly enough, Talbot was, um, uh, in the Simcoe papers, uh, which are in the Ontario archives, Talbot is mentioned quite frequently as Simcoe's agent to the Indian yeah. agents in Upper New York State. Yeah. And Sir William Johnston's son, Sir John Johnson, succeeded Sir William Johnson. And I think that uh, Sir William Johnson's uh, plan of settlement had quite an influence on Colonel Talbot mm. in deciding that that's what he wanted to do. Yeah. I think it was those trips to Upper New New York State, yeah. which, which uh, Johnston had settled. Yeah, because Johnston did have quite a settlement there, didn't he? And uh, now, uh, let's, let, we can't spend too long on this earlier part with uh, uh, Talbot because we want to get into his career, but in 1793, uh, they moved back to York, which was now going to be the new uh, capital, eh? and they laid out the plan of York. Yes. And uh, then in 1794, he goes back to England to join his regiment, and he serves in Holland. He's supposed to have served Gibraltar for a time. In 1799, he's again in Holland, and he's a 2IC of the regiment there. And yes. then uh, uh, that's his military career. Right. Now, George, I just wanted to show you yeah. one thing here, if the screen will pick it up. This is a letter written by Colonel Talbot to his boss, who was the Duke of York. Yeah, and we, uh, every school child knows about the grand old Duke of York, who had 10,000 men, and <laughs> he marched them up to the top of the hill. And, and uh, it's rather like Humpty Dumpty, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> anyway, the Duke of York was in charge of the military operations mm -hmm. that were taking place in Holland. And Colonel Talbot, I'm, uh, if one looked into it, you would probably find that he was a chum of the Duke of York. And in writing to him, you can see, uh, this is a good example of his handwriting, um, uh, you can see, uh, you can see uh, the kind of handwriting that he had, which isn't very much different from the kind of handwriting that we, a lot of people have today, a little bit indecipherable, mm. but a lot of people's handwriting is today. Yeah. And, um, uh, he, he, he speaks in fairly familiar terms to the Duke of York about, he's talking about, um, his proposal to go to Canada or to give up his military mm -hmm. career. Um, and so this is really the first inkling that, that he is going to start up the settlement. What is the date of that letter? 1799. Yeah. It's, um, it's in, yes, yeah. it's in 1799. Yeah. Well, then in the, on the 25th... Just, the, just before we go yeah. on, I, I'd just like to show this other right, little fine. thing yeah. because it's, a, it's an interesting curiosity of, about early writing. And that is, if you if you could go down on that now, um, a lot of letters were uh, rather like airmail forms, and people had a lot to say to each other. And so instead of just writing across the page like that, they would write across the page, and then they would turn the page at right angles, and they would write across the page again. So you had a a, a letter that was written this way. And then you had to turn the page and read it this way. Yeah. <laughs> the you idea got, was to say In other words, you got uh, two pages of two writing pages and one page. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> uh, they, they are uh, uh, fairly difficult to read, aren't they, when you're trying well, to read them? I don't them know. I, they, I think Some if you get used are. to it, you, yeah. you, 